May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing unto you, O God. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Last Wednesday, Martha mentioned a young woman who loved Jesus and joined the church, but then after a little while discovered that she didn't like Jesus' friends, and so she left. I get that. I don't like all of Jesus' friends either. I like all of you. <laughs> but I don't think any of us likes all of Jesus' friends. But we do all like Jesus. We do all love Jesus. And I think that's one of the things that's really striking about this gospel passage is here we come across some people who don't like Jesus. And in fact, such is their dislike for him that they set about to entrap him, to catch him up in some things that he might say because they want to make him look bad. And so what do they do to try to make him look bad? They ask him a tax question. Now, some of you may know, many of you probably don't know that I'm a financial advisor and have been for over 20 years. And I know for ex from experience, whether in public seminars or client presentations or meetings or what have you, that invariably there is someone in the crowd who would like an opportunity to make it look like you don't know what you're talking about. And invariably, what they want to ask you about, they come up with some question, and it's a tax question. <laughs> and so that, in fact, is what is asked of Jesus. And here's the question. Is it lawful to pay taxes? Well, I know the answer. Yes, it's lawful. The Income Tax Act is very clear that every Canadian who earns income in a given year must file a tax return and declare that income and pay taxes accordingly. And yeah, there's ways that we can try and reduce the taxes, RSP contributions, put money away in a TFSA, claim medical deductions and other tax credits, and so on. But that's not what Jesus is being asked, is it? There's something else that's going on here. What is it that's really going on? We're told that the question is put to Jesus by some disciples of the Pharisees who've been sent, and they've been sent along with some Herodians. Hmm. Something doesn't sit quite right there. The Herodians were a political party in Palestine who followed in the ways and were started by King Herod. Not the King Herod that's alive in Jesus' day. In fact, Herod dies approximately in the same year that Jesus is born. But Herod was a pretty amazing ruler. He ruled Palestine for 34 years. He built all kinds of incredible things, some of which are still standing even today. Politically, he was able to manipulate power-hungry Romans, all kinds of factions of religious Jews and secularizing Jews. He was able to pull all of them together and to make them work into some semblance of order and prosperity. Herod was impressive. Herod was effective. Herod was successful. But he was also secular and godless. And there were many Jews who would have nothing to do with him. For these Jews, there was no life that was worth living, no matter how successful or how prosperous, that did not honor God. These were the Pharisees. And they set about trying to find ways to preserve and protect Jewish identity. Their intentions were well-meaning. They put together an array of rules and customs. The problem was that over time, the Jewish identity they wanted to preserve became more external than internal. They became small-minded. The Pharisees and Herodians were like at opposite ends of the spectrum of the day. And yet, they come together here in their opposition to Jesus. So how does Jesus handle the question? He's well aware of their malice. He's well aware of their intention to test him. He recognizes that this is not an honest question. This is a loaded question. He calls them hypocrites. He calls for a coin to examine it. 
whose name and title is on the coin? The emperor's. And then Jesus says, give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things are, that are God's. Wow, what a response. It's brilliant. How many times have you been in a disagreement, well, maybe not with your spouse, but with somebody else, and you come away and think, oh, I should have said. Jesus knocks it out of the park. He totally silences them. And they go away amazed until another time. Now, this is a side of Jesus that we are not used to seeing. This is not lowly Jesus, meek and mild. This is Jesus engaged in face-to-face -face conflict with people who are opposed to him. Now, we've already mentioned Gord Downian, saddened by the news of his passing. A few weeks ago, there was another who died. Rock legend Tom Petty died very suddenly of a heart attack, aged 66. Any Tom Petty fans here? Oh, excellent. Now, Tom Petty didn't have much of a singing voice. He wasn't the greatest musician, but he had a terrific ear for great tunes, and he wrote some fabulous songs. And one of his hits gained, or became almost the status of an anthem. Well, I won't back down. No, I won't back down. You can stand me up at the gates of hell, but I won't back down. No, I won't back down. That's Jesus here. Jesus recognizing what are the issues. And basically saying and demonstrated, demonstrating, I won't back down. Though you stand me up at the gates of hell, though all of you face me and confront me and oppose me, I will not back down. Why is he so resolute? What's going on? I want to suggest to you that there's a challenge, maybe a difficulty, in the ways that we typically read the Bible. That we follow the good direction and guidance of the lectionary. But it means then that we, we read a passage or we may use a devotional guide and we may read a verse. And I want to suggest to you that over time that kind of engenders in us an approach to reading the Bible in a way that I would call punctuated, that's small, that's broken apart, that never sees it in terms of its overall context. So when Matthew wrote this gospel, there were no verses, there were no chapters, it was just one long narrative. And that's the way it was read. And it would be great benefit for all of us from time to time to take that kind of approach to reading Scripture. To read the Gospel as a whole. And when we do that here, we see all kinds of things. And I just want to draw your attention to a few. We recognize the larger narrative context. And, and for this portion here, this passage here, it's really launched by chapter 21, which tells us about Jesus' triumphal entry. And lo and behold, all of the crowds respond, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There's celebration. There's joy. And Jesus' first destination in entering the city is to go to the temple. And he creates trouble. He casts out the money changers. He cleanses the temple. He leaves for the day, but he's back next day, back in the temple, teaching, healing. And it's at that point that he's confronted by the chief priests and the elders of the people. And they come to him and they say, by what authority are you doing this? Who has given you this authority? To do what you're doing and saying what you're saying. And Jesus recognizes what's going on. And he comes back with a question. He says, I'll answer your question if you answer mine about John the Baptist. Well, they recognize immediately there's all kinds of problems and issues because of their non-receptivity to John the Baptist. They've got all the crowds listening. They don't want to be in trouble with all of the crowds. So they say, hmm, we don't know which is a lie. They do know. 
but they choose not to answer the question. And Jesus says, then I'm not going to answer your question. And immediately, that then leads Jesus to tell and teach three parables. The parables are not intended for the disciples. They're not intended for the crowd who are there listening in. These parables are intended for the chief priests and the elders. It's to them that he's speaking. It's for them that he's giving these words. And as he does, he gives them three parables. The parable of the two sons. And his point is, they are the son who says they're going to do what the father asks, but don't. He tells the parable of the wicked tenants. They are the wicked tenants who refuse to respond to the landowner, who are rejecting the cornerstone that the builders are given. He says to them the parable of the wedding banquet, saying to them that they are the ones coming up with excuses and not accepting the invitation of God to come to the wedding banquet. Three parables directed very pointedly at them. And they come back with three questions. The first question we already know that the Pharisees and the Herodians come along and ask him this tax question. Right next, immediately, are the Sadducees who come with a question about the resurrection. And then thirdly, there is a lawyer from the Pharisees who asks a question about the greatest commandment. And finally, Jesus brings it all together. He brings it to a head by asking just one question of them. About the Messiah. Whose son is he? He asks. That's the issue. Who is the son? See, each of the three parables, each one is about a son. The parable of the two sons, there is an obedient son. The parable of the wicked tenant, tenants culminates in the killing and casting out of the son. The third parable is about the wedding banquet. Who is the wedding banquet for? For the son. This is about the son. Who is the son? All leading into Jesus' question, and who do you think the Messiah is? Whose son is he? And Jesus is making it very clear what his answer is. Jesus is saying, I am the Son. I am the Messiah. I am the one with the authority. I am the one who has been given that authority by the Father. I have this authority. And so, Matthew's Gospel ends in chapter 28 with Jesus after his resurrection and about leave his disciples in the ascension and his final words are all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth I am the one who has this authority it is Jesus and Jesus alone who is the son it is Jesus and Jesus alone who has all authority not just over taxes not over the names that other people would give us, not over the lit, just over the labels with which people want to define and limit us, but all authority in heaven and on earth. And Jesus has this authority, and Jesus exercises this authority for you, for me, for everyone. Let's look at a coin. Whose name is on it? It's Her Majesty, the Queen. The queen by the grace of God. Such is what belongs to the Emperor. But what are the things of God? Or more rightly, who are the people of God? Take a look at yourself. Take a look at your neighbor person sitting beside you, the person sitting in front of you, the person sitting behind you. Do you see? Whose name? It's the name of Jesus. Stamped by the authority of Jesus. And by Jesus given the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. My friends, this is the good news. 
This is the gospel of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Mm-hmm.